Starling gets a bit less attention from the general public since what people usually expect from SpaceX are massive rockets landing vertically like we're finally living in the future. But SpaceX launching a satellite internet service sounds a bit less exciting if you're not part of the die-hard fan community. The reality though is that Starlink might actually be key to SpaceX's long-term success, in addition to being a commercial and even geopolitical disruption. Before we get into the dramatic potential consequences that Starlink might be responsible for, let's first understand what this side project by SpaceX really is. Starlink is a constellation of thousands of satellites that circle around Earth and provide internet access directly from the sky. You pay $499 to order a dish called Dishimac Flatface, yeah, no joke, and then $99 per month for the service. You set up the dish in your garden, provided it has an unobstructed line of sight to the sky, and there you go. The dish magically orients itself to find its satellite path and you have access to the internet, just like that. The first advantage of this system is obviously for remote areas which have no or bad internet service through cables or mobile networks. But of course, when one talks about accessing the internet, speed and stability are of the essence. At the time of the recording of this video, the service is still in beta stage and it's called better than nothing, so to lower your expectations. In reality though, most users report having rather good internet speeds and being able to do most of the stuff online that they need. Even the latency is in the acceptable range so far, but we'll get back to technical details later in the video. For now, the biggest problem seems to be the stability of the service. You might hop in a Zoom call that will work fine most of the time just to slow down or completely disconnect every once in a while. This prevents users from using it for things like gaming at this point, especially that even a single tree in the path of the signal will break the connection. However, the app will tell you exactly at which point of the day the line of sight is obstructed, so you adjust the position of your mashy dishy flag face. This is why current beta testers go great lengths in order to lift their dishes as high up in the sky as possible, which then threatens them to fall during high winds, but hey, that's another problem. Anyway, no service is perfect from the start, especially that beaming data from space is not something new. Such services exist since long ago, but they are expensive and not very efficient for good reason. It takes billions of dollars in order to create an orbital infrastructure good enough for the end customer to be able to pop online for $99 per month. For most services like this, a few satellites were positioned in geostationary orbits so to lower the costs and always cover one same area on Earth. The problem is that this orbit is so far away, 35,000 kilometers above Earth, that latency is in the unacceptable range above 600 milliseconds. And there's no way to change it unless you manage to break the rules of the universe. Starlink, however, decided to position its satellite in the lower Earth orbit at around 550 km altitude, which allows for low latency from the physical standpoint, but which makes the whole constellation more complex, since the satellites are constantly on the move and change position. That is why traditional satellite internet never took off at massive scale, but remained constrained to niche services such as emergency connections and military. The latency is bad, it's very expensive, and in order to improve it, they would need to invest billions upfront to position and synchronize thousands of satellites in lower orbits. No company could risk investing such amounts in the face of regular ground cable internet provider competition. But here comes Elon Musk, thinking that it could just work and be profitable. Today, about 42 million Americans still don't have broadband access. Of course, the number is much higher when it comes to the whole world. But after narrowing everything down, Elon estimates that Starlink could generate around $30 billion per year. In absolute terms, numbers like this don't give any indication to normal human beings unless you put them into perspective, which is that SpaceX annual revenue at this point in time is about $3 billion. Yep. Launching rockets generates 3 billion per year, while providing internet could make 10 times that. However, Elon is known for consistently overpromising everything, and independent experts estimate that Starlink could maybe reach a 10 billion dollar in revenue in a few years at best. It's still an impressive number, and if it works out, Starlink can basically be like a side quest that you need to complete before you can advance in the main story, which is human space travel between the Earth, Moon, and Mars. 
SpaceX finances are not disclosed to the public since it's a private company. But as I explained in my previous video about it, it's pretty much understood that even though they might be profitable thanks to commercial launches only, the American government indirectly subsidizes it through overpaid NASA and military contracts. As this situation is always a bit shaky and can vary from administration to administration, it's a good idea for SpaceX to find an even more profitable source of revenue in order to fund its riskier ventures itself. So Starlink has the potential to become to SpaceX what AWS is to Amazon. In case you didn't know, even though Amazon makes the most revenue from e-commerce sales, more than half of the profit actually comes from its cloud hosting service, as counterintuitive as it sounds. And while we're at it, Amazon obviously now also decided to launch its own satellite-based internet service. The problem for Jeff is that Amazon has a lot of catching up to do. While they're planning to launch first satellites at an yet undecided date, SpaceX already has thousands of Starlink satellites in orbit and the number of users crossed 69420 in June 2021. In February of the same year, there were 10,000 of them. So the number of users is growing, the service works, and the infrastructure will only improve from now on. If we get into more technical details, the first generation of Starlink satellites are basically connecting your dish to a ground station. These ground stations are themselves connected to the regular cable network on the ground, which means that the signal travels from your PC to the flatty Mac dish face, then to the orbit, through the satellite, and then back down to the ground station and the terrestrial optical fiber network. The fact that the signal has to pass several times through these different relays increases latency compared to when your PC is directly connected to fiber optic cables. But the speed of light being 50% faster in vacuum than it is in glass, the end result is actually pretty much identical on a scale of a country like the United States, for example. However, the next generation of Starlink satellites will have laser communication enabled between them. Meaning that once your signal reaches a satellite, it can go to another satellite, then to another one, and so on, until it gets back down to Earth to a ground station. Meaning that it can travel a vast distance in space over places where there are no ground stations, like above oceans or in the poles. And that's what can have massive consequences for the world. First of all, over long distances like this, let's say between New York and London, such satellite communication will beat optical fiber latency. As of today, it stands at about 65 milliseconds for most people. Starlink could theoretically lower it down to 43 milliseconds. But you might wonder, does this really make any difference? The answer is yes, and very much so, especially for financial markets who are ready to pay up for better latency. As said previously, 65 milliseconds is the latency for the general public between New York and London. But Hibernia Express, a private optical cable, offers 59.95 milliseconds. It required an investment of $300 million to create and now serves specifically financial markets for which this 5 milliseconds difference is enough to justify the cost. So just imagine how much these institutions would be willing to pay for every millisecond gained by Starlink. Second, even though Starlink isn't even fully functional yet, Russia has already decided to fine individuals and companies using it hundreds and even thousands of dollars. The reason being that controlling internet communication is key for dictatorships, and they can monitor pretty much everything as long as the internet providers and data centers are located inside the country. Same as China, which controls all internet traffic and pretty much keeps its citizens locked in the national internet, except a small fraction of those who dare to use VPNs to access the outside world. One of the preferred tricks of dictators is to shut off communications during mass protests. This is done in countries like Iran and Belarus, for example. In the former, during the 2020 demonstrations, the regime shut off mobile internet coverage but kept landlines. That's when people asked anyone living in the lower floors of buildings to turn off passwords of their internet routers so people in the streets could keep some communication channels open. Although these lines can also be shut off if needed. Of course, it won't be easy to hide a pizza-sized dish from a regime, but not impossible. In the future, we could see resistant movements in places like Myanmar, where Starlink dishes would be set up on top of trees in the jungle, or on mountaintops, or even on top of buildings, camouflaged between countless other satellite dishes. Also, as the number of satellites in the orbit increases, it is likely that user dishes will get smaller in size as well. 
The potential for people in repressed countries to circumvent the government's communication blockage using a service like Starlink is huge and probably will materialize eventually. With that being said, Starlink has pretty terrifying downsides as well. One of them being a massive sky pollution that threatens the work of astronomers around the world, since these tiny satellites are being captured in long exposure shots of the deep sky. Fortunately, SpaceX takes the problem seriously and works closely with world scientists in order to mitigate it, like for example painting the satellites black and changing their orientation so they reflect less sunlight. So far the results are encouraging, but not enough, especially given that the numbers of these satellites is expected to increase dramatically, without even counting those of all other companies that now want to cover the globe with their own satellites as well. And the second big risk is called the Kessler effect. It's a theory which states that at some point there will be so many objects in the orbit around Earth that one collision between two of them will create enough debris to start a chain reaction of collisions with more and more other objects until eventually the whole space around Earth is blanketed with so much space garbage that all space activities become nearly impossible for the generations to come. Yeah, this scenario is terrifying, especially because it is realistic. Now, if the Kessler effect doesn't ever kick in to doom humanity, or if we find ways to collect space junk, Starlink might potentially generate enough money to fund SpaceX further ambitions such as space travel between Earth, Moon and Mars. There are also talks about partly spinning out Starlink and offering it to the public through an IPO, uh, therefore raising a few more billions for further private space exploration. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, it helps my channel tremendously, and of course, subscribe to be notified when new videos come out. See you soon!